here still at GDC, McLean Deemer. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be talking a little briskly because we have this room for a sort of limited window of time. So preemptive uh, warning to any future listeners that this episode may or may not end up chopping down the middle as we continue the conversation some other time. But I will start off by saying I've just come from your GDC talk in which you got into your Guild Wars 2 uh, grand adventure into the music of Korea. And I got to say that was probably one of my favorite GDC talks I have ever seen. Wow. It was so awesome. Oh, thank you. I felt it was the best version of what it of the like the, most of my time in academia was i'll say mixed mm -hmm. uh, i think a lot of composers can relate to that sentiment um and this was such a like a joyous celebration of uh a really clear depth of of knowledge that you you took you clearly took really seriously but i love that you had such a kind of fun attitude about getting into it i, I just mm -hmm. i can't I found myself trying to think, how am I going to summarize my reaction to this? It just, because it was so informative. Um, and so, um, uh, just, I don't know, it's, there's like the raw example of what it is to feel really inspired by someone's work. So, mm. um, I mean, I, I really enjoy what I have heard of the music and I haven't heard every bit of it, but I, um, I, I remember hearing it and going, this feels way above average in the way that people sort of attempt to integrate non-Western traditions into Western music. There's yeah. a large tradition of that being really lame. And it was really clear that you were doing something saying, okay, how do I avoid all the, that stuff? But hearing you step through, and, and I have to say that I, I, I promise that you will actually talk during this <laughs> podcast eventually, but I need you to just listen and, and absorb me praising you for a minute. Um, because in addition to the incredible deep dive that you did, and I love that you exposed your blunders mm. in in like the the kind of oh I, I i watched a youtube video i understand everything now uh, the fact that you uh that you really kind of t pulled the curtain back on the process of of the humbling experience of oh shit i i i've been caught sort of with my pants down on this uh, and not really doing my homework sufficiently and, and to to be so open and 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 in a way of vulnerable about that was great but the other thing i just want to say up front and then and then we'll just go wherever we want to go here is uh w especially in the film half of our brethren in this business yeah um there's this whole ongoing one of the one of the things being discussed in this moment is this idea of um when a composer is sort of you know selling themselves as this maverick lone soul crazy person in their cavern cooking up genius right versus somebody who is directing a production and whether that means oh i just have an orchestrator who helps prepare sheet music or whether that means i got a staff of composers and i am kind of the creative director of this musical operation and everything in between uh varies project by project etc 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 even despite how much pressure there is right now from all corners for composers to be uh, really transparent about that and to be crediting people and to be really kind of exposing what it takes to make it. Sure. I think there's still a very understandable reticence to be truly transparent because I think at the end of the day, we're all human and we're, especially artists tend to be neurotic and self-conscious. And there's just this fear that, you know, if I employed someone's help and then I make very clear what they did, I may sort of talk my way out of a career, you know, like mm. there's a certain anxiety and I totally understand that self-consciousness uh, because it's, it's like, Oh, you loved that piece. Well, they did it. <laughs> you sure. know? And it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go talk to them then. Like I can see the, the logical train. I, I think we've probably all experienced some version of that. Um, and so just again, credit to you that throughout your presentation and then culminating in this you know, step through of everyone on the team at the end. Um, it was so different from what we're used to, to see this just very candid praise of like, oh, this person wrote that, this person wrote that, this person really kicked my ass and made me realize how little I knew and wrote that. And like, 
again, we're on, on all these different levels from the broad professionalism of what it is to be a composer to the actual specifics of what you made for this project. I was just so bowled over. And that's why I was like, I don't want to say anything <laughs> to you until I can have a record of this so you can get the, the fresh raw one. Because fuck yeah, man. It was absolutely amazing. Oh, well, I mean, first of all, I'm grateful that you were there. Uh, I'm grateful that anybody was there. Um, and, you know, <laughs> thank you for saying that. Uh, I've always said, specifically in regards to Guild Wars, from the very beginning, that I'm, I'm not the guy on the mountain doling out score sheets and saying this is my music this is going in the game <laughs> you know accept it thank me and i'll you know i'll come back to you with my next work of genius um because as a career i've kind of backed into this i mean i, I truly had given up on the idea of making music as a profession when i got into games i, I got into it as a sound designer and i thought that, that was just going to be my career i was very happy to do that and i have heroes who are sound designers that are equally as important to me as my musical heroes um, and, and then I got lucky, right? So I, I inherited Guild Wars from the previous composer, Jeremy Soule, who did an amazing job and whose work I'm still kind of, it looms large over what I do, right? Because he established the entire tone of the franchise with the first game and then the, the core game that shipped originally in 2012. So I've always said that I'm just the steward of the music. At some point, someone else will probably take this over and, I, and, and, and you know, my era will have passed, right? I'll, I'll be like, Roger Moore, right? If Jeremy Soul is uh, is Sean Connery, <laughs> then I'm Roger Moore, and you know, at some point uh, we'll get a Pierce Brosnan in here, or hopefully a Daniel Craig to That's take over. So funny. Um, but yeah, you know, I, 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 I will let me just interject really briefly and, and take some issue with that because you have taken it places so beyond the. It, I don't think it's fair. Like, by way of analogy, I would say Gordy is a steward of the Star Wars music at mm -hmm. the moment because he, he is he is to a ludicrous fidelity very faithful to like ludicrous meaning the precision with which he can he can kind of craft that music is kind of mind-boggling to me sure. I mean it's really occasionally uh, and, and I mean this in the in the best way it's hard to tell if it's not actually John Williams music and and just given the sophistication of how John Williams writes that's a very small landing zone to 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 like parachute onto and to, mm. to do it gordy's now written more star wars music than john williams has like yeah. it's it's insane it's long overdue for mm -hmm. uh you know a movie or a tv show let's well get, let's I'm get happy that let's get that on record yeah i mean <laughs> I, I i don't disagree there although i'm perfectly happy for him to continue to keep the bar so high in games mm. as well but um but that i would call being a steward personally uh because you've You've expanded it into something you've really, I mean, I'm, I fully confess I'm not the world's largest expert on the music of Guild Wars. Sure. But, I mean, I've certainly listened to what came before and I've listened to what's, you know, especially when you um, went freelance and but continued to sort of add to that. It really feels like it's, you've looked for every opportunity to say, how do we expand this and branch it out and add depth and and um even just the nature of the recording sessions seems mm -hmm. higher grade um i mean it's so give yourself more credit i would oh. argue because it, it's i mean I, I love the the inherent humility of that but you've really um taken it's 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 a not an easy thing to take a franchise that has an established sound and an established audience that's probably very expectant of that and, mm. and say oh, we're gonna push the bar somewhere else yeah I mean, you know, I've had my, I'll say this publicly, like I've had ups and downs with it over, over the last decade that I've been working on it, right? Because, because I kind of stumbled backwards into it and then had to do all this catching up to at least get to where the bar was with it before I started and then see how much can I push it? You know, how can we go this way? Can we go that way? How far in those directions can we go? And then um, uh, three or four years ago, uh, there was a pretty traumatic event that happened at the studio where a, a third of the studio got laid off. Um, mm -hmm. It was 180 people, uh, which is a lot, you know, and that's a lot of people all of a sudden to just not be, you know, on. It this. lost 180. I or, think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, wow. it was a I lot. I didn't remember the numbers. It was, it was quite a bit. It was, it was a third was, of the company. Does that mean there were like 600 people there? Maybe I'm misremembering it. Maybe it was 120. It was over 100, um, and it was, Amazing. it was a solid one third of the company, um, and. That was that was a real dividing line for me where I thought maybe this is my chance 
you know, as Roger Moore to say, this is my last one. Uh, and let's hand it off to Timothy Dalton for the Bond heads out there. Um, I didn't gloss underrated. over him. Underrated. It's one of my favorites. Totally um, with you. But uh, yeah, I stepped back. You know, I said, I think I, I think I got to take a break. At the very least, I have to take a break for a little bit. Like, don't come to me. I think the, the well is run dry. I'm repeating myself. I, I don't feel myself pushing my, my creativity at all. And certainly my career opportunities because I've gotten comfortable just doing this. And it's a double-edged sword, as you know. It's great to have a gig as a freelancer, and you want a steady gig. Um, but it, it was the only thing I was doing, and I just did. I felt myself kind of languishing in that. Um, and it was this score for End of Dragons that they came to me a couple years ago and said, "Hey, can you come back and not just do some piecemeal stuff here and there? Can you like lead this?" Uh, and here's so why. that wasn't baked in. That wasn't just assumed. Like, no, no. And I, I, they gave me the option, right? Wow. And, and the case they made was. Um, was because it's not just yet another fantasy orchestra score. We need two, three hours of, of the same stuff that you've been hearing for a long time in this franchise and similar franchises. It was this appeal of the traditional Korean aspect and then the heavy electronic element and, fi and, and the challenge of finding a way to incorporate the Korean stuff in a way that made sense. And then finding a way to incorporate the electronic stuff in a way that didn't make it feel like a you know, sci-fi game. So yeah. how is it still going to fit into a, a, a purely fantasy world? And what motivated specifically the electronic? Is there something in the gameplay or that I'm just ignorant to? Yeah, I, I had to gloss over it in the talk, unfortunately, um, because it could have been its own thing. But there's um, the short version is the, this region that they've returned to uh, is surrounded by uh, a thing called the Jade Sea, which is this petrified, it's actually petrified jade. Um, or it's mm. petrified water that has become sort of transmuted into jade and has this magical essence that was imbued in it by a dragon. And they figured out a way to harness that and turn that into advanced technology that looks very futuristic. Oh, you did, you did make the kind of Wakanda comparison. That's, that's the, yeah, that's the elevator version of it. Right. Um, and so there, you know, it, it does sort of delve a little bit into Blade Runner territory, especially at night in some of the more populated city areas. It's all very neon and glowy and things floating and, and mm. you know, that blurring that line between technology and magic, which which they've done a little bit in the past. It's not like it's new for Guild Wars, but the, the level they took it to is very extreme. So they essentially wanted to recreate, you know, a Hong Kong or a Seoul, you know, like a modern Asian city in Guild Wars. And, yeah. and then, you know, what does that sound like? And so they called it, instead of calling it cyberpunk, they call it jade punk. That's a term that they threw around, <laughs> they threw around a lot. That's funny. Um, and they specifically asked for more synthesizers. And how, 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 like, one of the recurring complaints with folks is when you have a kind of long running relationship with somebody and you've done a very specific and consistent thing, they see you as you're the guy that does that. Hmm. So, oh, okay, we want a analog synth kind of thing. Who, who do we know that does that? And they don't, think to ask you without knowing that that's thoroughly within your wheelhouse well see, clearly they did just go to you and how did they know especially if you talked about feeling like you were catching up on mm. your sort of musical chops at, at an earlier point you know are, are you just how, how, what made them what made them realize that you actually could do it yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I think part of it is the trust that I have with the audio director there, Drew Katie, who's who's truly a friend outside of any work relationship. Uh, you know, I've known him since day one uh, that I started there twelve years ago. Um, and, uh, and 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 just as a pause, just for my own context, remind me after migrating kind of out of the sound, what was your actual title? Because you weren't audio director, right? But, or were you? No, no. Uh, when I started, you mean? No, no, no but like the, the position that you, up until going freelance, like the culmination of your internal position. Yeah. There was nothing really formal. It was really just in-house composer. And sometimes towards the end, I would call myself the musical director because I started bringing on teams and, and you know, having other right. people involved. But it's not like I had a business card that said that. It was kind of a self-styled right, uh, term. Um, I, I, you know, I think that, I think that at the studio... A lot of times it's it's a successful studio and a successful franchise, but there's a lot of things that the studio is punching above its weight, right? Mm. Um, I, I've had this conversation so much with people where everybody knows Guild Wars, but nobody plays it, right? Um, and a part <laughs> part of that is is uh, there's a, that's a, that could be another talk, um, but part of that I think is I mean, there must be millions of players still for to sustain the company. Absolutely, yeah, and part par so part of it is the relationship that players have with a game like that, right? You. People basically choose if they're going to play an MMO, 
that type of game, they're just going to pick one because that's all they it's have like time the Eve for. Community is the same where they're sure. like that they're it's not the biggest, but they're it's like their religion. It's the so core to their life. Yeah, I had a guy come up to me after the talk and say, "I'm here because my sister's a huge Guild Wars fan." I mean, he's like, "It was great talk, whatever." But I'm here, and she would kill me if I didn't say, you know that she loves the game and she loves your music and she has 5,000 hours in the game. Can you imagine that? 5,000 hours. That's uh, what I always tell people about when, you know, all these, our, our friends and colleagues who mostly specialize in film, um, you know, will work on a film that gets seen by millions of people. And then you go and you look on Spotify and you're like, absolutely no one is listening to the soundtrack album. Mm. And it might even be really good because the conversion rate to the sort of random swath of audience members is very low. To, it takes a very unusual, like a soundtrack album that's really exposed as part of the film. Like it's just one of those that's really featured like Star Wars or something, or yeah. it's, it's got some shtick or some gimmick, like, you know, that's really, you know, noteworthy collaboration behind it or something like that. And, and But generally speaking, the conversion rate is really low. And they always look with envy to our corner where it's like, you know, a thousand people can play the game. But yeah. 950 will go find the album. And I always say it's a kind of Stockholm syndrome because they, they'll play the game for like 100 hours. And, and even if – like even as a casual player, it's like, oh, I, I only dipped my toes in Elden Ring. I didn't really play it that much. So mm -hmm. it's like 35 hours. Well, right. it's like, what album have you listened to for <laughs> yeah. 35 hours? I mean it's like you can pick your favorite album of all time and it's probably those kinds of numbers. But yeah, yeah. For, for a gamer, that's like, you know – you're kind just getting trivial. started. You're just warming up. Yeah. So it's, I kind of feel like we're sort of cheating because yeah. they get so much exposure to our work. Cause I mean, 5,000 hours is, I don't know if I've ever listened to anything even a, like a 10th of that. Yeah. I, I, I guess it's hard to even fathom like other than like being alive and maybe <laughs> the culmination of time that you've been eating across your entire life. You can say, oh, well that's 5,000 hours of meals in my life. That makes sense <laughs> to me, you know? Yeah, uh, that's you're right. So, so the game. I mean, the the game. The, there's the players are so dedicated to it, and then internally they have an amazing kind of uh, like you know economy team, essentially commerce team that that knows how to manage it to, to keep the lights on and allow it to be this thing that just hums along at a constant rate and it never has these massive spikes. So, um, hmm. it, yeah. It, so the studio. It, it's seen from the outside as as a success, but we don't get a blank check to do a lot of stuff. And, and I think that they know that. And maybe that, to answer your original question, is it's like, well, we need music. It's just like McLean's the music guy, right? It's why why get somebody in if he's going to be the guy that we know can maximize what we need for this game. He can squeeze that rag and get the absolute last drop out of it that, that we need. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, I've sort of proven, I guess, over the decade that I've been doing it, that, that I can just keep pushing a little further. It's like, if you just give me a little bit more time and a little bit more money, you know, it'll be so much better. And, and each one, I, I, I try to make exponentially better than the last one. And that was the thing I said to Drew when he pitched End of Dragons to me. I said, if I'm going to come back, this has to be the best Guild Wars music that we've ever done. And so often you set a lofty goal like that for yourself and you, and you never get there. You just want to get to the end of the project and not have it fall apart. And this in my opinion, it was one of these rare occasions where I think it all came together. It's as good as I wanted it to be when we started. I mean, it certainly feels that way from this perspective. I mean, you know, there's there's just so much that you did right, including the course corrections where they were needed. And and um, and like I said, also from a production standpoint, you know, clearly just so committed to everything being all that it can be. Uh, there's so much that just resonated. So especially like not to you know, name names, but there's just so many scores that, that aspire to this kind of cross pollination culturally. Mm -hmm. And they, and you even phrased it perfectly. I've used all but those same words in talking to people before. Of, it's such the Hollywood thing to go, just put a low drone and, you know, grab a percussion instrument and in no way try to use it how they use it. Just mm -hmm. like grab that sound. Yeah. And then hire someone to just kind of meander over top it and be like, there's right. my super ethnomusicologically sophisticated mashup. And it's like, you know, that trick was novel 50 years ago. Right. And, you know, represented, I think, a first step of like, oh, that's kind of cool the way they, the way these sort of things are talking to each other. 
And it's so, there's something so about relying so solely on uh, improvising soloists to be mm-hmm. like, I need you to kind of gussy up my thing here. There's something also very kind of cynical about that. And, yeah. and it just, I, I just loved how you, you really, you approached it in an almost analytical way of, okay, how do I, how do I break down? I was, there's so many moments that struck me. I feel like such a fanboy right now, but there's such a, the, the way you kind of showcased the, the regional, uh, distinctions and how they, they all have kind of their own emergent sort of scales and patterns and mel- melodic implications. And, yeah. uh, it's just a, a depth and a respect of material that is just so unheard of. I guess one of the questions you, 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 you kind of tapped on this a little bit, but why, what, what made the team go to Korea versus they could have gone anywhere on the planet? Yeah. What about Korea spoke to them as a, as a touch point to, to make such a deep dive into. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, part of it is, is a course correction on the part of the studio, right? So this area, this ins- that's inspired by East Asia is called Kantha in the game. And it's a pre-existing thing from Guild Wars one, uh, mm. uh, 2006, I think was the, was a little a mini sort of expansion, uh, or standalone kind of add on that took place there. It's been a fan favorite literally since they Guild Wars 2 launched. There's a, me- a meme among the community about, you know, when is Cantha or Cantha confirmed? Like they would just sort of look for a little read between the lines of, of, uh, of PR stuff to know, That's is funny. this going to be when Cantha comes out? So fans have been clamoring for it. And I think the studio didn't know how to come back to it because it was this pastiche, right? Right. Um, and broadly we, Asian as they like, yes. is like no distinction between what makes two of us separate from Mongolia, from Japan, from Absolutely. Korea, from China, from Absolutely. Thailand. And, and, you know, in a, in a, in the most broad terms possible, are they closer to each other than they are to, you know, a Western European based culture? Sure. But there's so that ignores so much in the same way that you say, you know, well, Europe, it's like, you know, Slovakia is the same as, as Portugal, right? It's like, they're all, it's all European, you know, uh, which is not the case at all. Right. So it's just as complex as those relationships, which we just get inundated with through our education system and our families, you know, through, you know, both good and bad reasons for that. So it's, I've, I have to say in recent years, I've, I've sympathized at some point, you know, it's easy to get this opinion, like, ah, it's so American to not really understand the rest of the world and make them come to us and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, but I, I will say, you know, cr- cultural crosstalk is not easy. My, my girlfriend is from Costa Rica and, you know, she's used to the idea that it's like to Americans, it, basically anything remotely Latin America, it's like Mexico is kind of a thing. And then every, everything else is, is kind of one jumble. And yeah. maybe like Brazil is kind of a, is different, but for most of Americans, it's just kind of like, yeah, you know, like south of the border is something. Right. right. And so, you know, she talks about her perception of that and people kind of learning what's the difference between Costa Rica and its neighbors. But, but the thing that's like what I love and what you did by going to, it's not even just Korean, but there's actually so much subset because the thing where it comes up at home with us is, you know, we'll be watching something and I'll burst out laughing like a TV show or whatever because I'll think it's really funny that they cast like this super Bostonian accent actor for this one role or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she'll be like, I don't hear it. And I'll be like, really? It's, it's like, it's, how do you not hear that? Sure. So I'll like go on YouTube and pull up like, okay, listen, here's like Alabama. Now here's like Detroit. Yeah. Now here, like these are really noticeable differences. She's like, I guess like to yeah. me, she's like, she, you know, cause English, she speaks English incredibly well, but it's not her first language. So like, there's a certain amount of brain power committed just by default to just translating. Right. Yeah. As, and she does it without noticing, but it's like, still we take it for granted. It's just deeper down in the system. And yeah. so I was like, we realize to an outsider, you know, even the internal dialects and things of the U S may be, may be lost on, on it, but it's there. And so yeah. give me some compact. I, I kind of was like, okay, I think it goes all directions. Everybody who's looking from the outside in is going to miss the subtleties, yeah. which makes it therefore, if you want to try to capture it, like yeah, you, there's have, a, you, you have got, to go deep, you your have work to. is cut out for you, yeah. you know, and you're, you're basically never going to, and, and I love that you established that up front. It was like the goal was not to be mistaken for a Korean composer. Right. The goal was a respectful and deep, like cross pollination. Yeah. For lack of a, I don't think if you, I don't remember if you use that exact word, but it seemed like that's very much the idea. Cause obviously you're bringing in these other things as well. Yeah. Um, and I think 
having conversations like this, you know, there's a tinge of irony that we're two white guys sitting here talking about this, but, but, you know, music is this amazing thing that can allow conversations like this that get, that can get a little bit pitched about who do, who has the right to do what, you know? Um, and that was kind of what my talk was, you know, a part of it was about, was about how to, how to do it with respect and it is possible to do it. And music becomes this amazing thing that, they want to share it. You know, there's, there shouldn't be a wall between the two of well, us. Well, and you right? show the Korean musician playing jazz, right? which is like, that's a perfect example of how beautiful music is so unique in this way. I mean, a lot of arts have this food can have this, like there's a, there's plenty of domains where people can really blend cultures and cultures can make love letters to each other. But that's, yeah, to me, it didn't feel respect is almost diminishing because you weren't just respectful. It felt like, uh, and I love, especially the way you ended the talk by saying this isn't the end of my relationship with this because we shipped this, but like this really got into my blood. Like mm. I really, this, uh, this is the beginning of my, you know, presumably lifelong relationship with these traditions. And I want to keep learning and I want to keep going farther with it. And that to me, it feels like a love letter to those traditions and to the musicians. Also, you made such a point of highlighting their quality. Again, all, I, I can't help, but just keep <laughs> going on. Cause it's all stuff that really matters to me, you know, like sure. this is the, something I try to bring into my own work. And, and, and when projects really, uh, call for this level of, 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 of depth of things that are technically outside of where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, you know, the question is how do you do it in a way that doesn't just kind of skim off the top in a way that's not, it's just missing all the good stuff, you know, it's missing yeah, all the yeah. respect and all the <clears throat> musicality. Well, so my, my, you know, my point about the, about, uh, updating the previous version of this was that I think it's important to have these conversations where you're talking about appropriation and colonialism and, and the, the bad way to do it. And, and it's very rarely do you get a chance so broadly to, to fix your past mistakes. Right. And I think the studio is sure. aware of that. And they said, well, we can't, we can't do that again. We can't just make a higher resolution or a higher resolution version of this pastiche that is already out there because we live in a different time for good reasons. So let's, yeah, let's hone, let's hone in on one. And then what's, what hasn't been done yet. Right. And truly, uh, I, I, I don't like making these broad proclamations, but I, I truly don't think that there's any, in the very least the video game space, there's nothing else that draws this type of inspiration from it. And certainly not in the West. So in that way, I hope that we can just kind of open a door, not, you know, I don't want, I don't, I'm not looking for praise for that, but it's just like, I hope that it's, this is the first of many things along the way. Um, and then, uh, you know, talking about music. So uh, this conversation I was having the other night with our mutual friend, Tim Ambrogi from Giant Squid. Uh -huh, yeah. We were talking about these moments where you pull on a thread of something in a game specifically is how, how it started. And then you just, you realize that there's so much more that you missed. So I was playing against another our other colleague, Gordy Hobb. I was playing Jedi Fallen Order a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and I beat the game, right? I, I got to the end of the story, and I thought, well, I love this game, so I'm not ready to turn it off. I'm going to 100% it, which I almost never do with the game. <laughs> um, so I start going around and just trying to find all the stuff that I'm missing, and then there was one world where I discovered an entire area of a map that is clearly inconsequential to the story, but it was like another three hours of content, four hours, uh, wow. And I, I was like, well, this is incredible. Like they put this in there knowing that you don't need to come here. You have, there's no point. And it's not just get a couple trophies and, and uncover a couple things. There's actual story content that's really cool and very Star Wars-y. It makes you care about things that like for me, I'm not a prequel guy. So like, it's just like it, it, it weaves the prequel and the original trilogy eras in a way that made me care about them deeply. And I thought, wow, this is really special. And this was probably a year's worth of uh, an entire team's work. And he was telling me about something that he put in the path list that it's just like, I, I can't replicate the, what you have to do to find it. But it's basically an impossible goal that you have to meet every criteria perfectly to do. <laughs> and I don't even know if he said anybody's done it, but it's just this like thing that he did for himself. And so for me, in a sense, this... I wonder, I'm trying to think what that would be. There's it a involves like a jumping puzzle and you have a narrow window of time. You got to jump through a hole and then you got to cross the entirety of the game and slide in this doorway that you have li you'll literally have one second left to do it if you do it perfectly uh you should have him explain it to you yeah, it's pretty funny I, it's possible i don't even know about that yeah i know that there's definitely a, you know like some abzu very off the path that was not intended how it sounds <laughs> there is some very uh, kind of hidden abzu reference uh uh in there i think it, uh, i think that might be part of it it could be yeah, yeah. that's it's one of those uh, those types of things i remember they did the same on journey where 
Um, there's this level that's kind of like a vertical temple. It's almost like a missile silo. It's like this cylindrical vertical space that you keep raising this kind of like force field water type thing that helps you kind of float. And you get all the way to the top and there's basically a thing you trigger and it plays a cutscene and you leave. But if for some reason you have this bizarre curiosity to swim all the way down to the bottom, because if you basically jump in this, it's like, you can't really tell, is it a liquid or am I in like a force field? But if you, if you jump into that and then just sort of let off the controller and let yourself sink all the way to the bottom, getting it to the top releases the little like wormies from our very first game flow, mm. just swimming around at the bottom. And I, I remember I said to them, what if, um, if you sing to it, it sings back, but with flow sound effects. And so we put mm. that in the game and you get a trophy for it. And it's like, I don't know why anyone would even think to go there because it really, the game is screaming at you. There's the door. Yeah. And I, I don't know. That's one of those little funny things that's, again, it's, it's very specific to games that there's no equivalent to in film. And I always love those things that, that you know, they're so unique to this corner of the industry, this, this, this corner of media, I mean, this corner of entertainment. Right. Um, well, so anyway, so that, but you were saying. Oh, yeah. So, that, so, how, so how that idea relates to the score, the End of Dragon score, is that, you know, I, and I said this a little bit in the talk is like, what a, what a gift that is to find a, a total blank spot in your area of expertise. Like I, I'm assuming that you're like me, I love music, right? And, and I don't just love making the same music over and over again. And I turned 40 over the course of this project and how amazing it is it, is it at 40 to say, this is, this thing gives me the same charge that picking up a guitar did when I was a kid or when I first heard the opening music to Star Wars and I need to, I need to pull on that thread and I need to chase that until I fully, mm. fully grasp it and fully like incorporate it into who I am as a person and as an artist. And you know, those opportunities become more and more rare just as you are alive and have more experience. So that it, I, when I discovered that this is what was happening, I, I, I had to dive in. I had to like triple down on learning this stuff because I'm like, I got to maintain this feeling as long as I can because I don't know if I'll ever get a chance. I hope so, but I don't know if I'll get the chance to feel that something special is happening so strongly ever again. Yeah, well, it, it, it comes through. Um, why don't we step back just because I, I was so excited to just go straight into this because of your your talk was so good. I really hope it ends up on YouTube, uh, eventually for anyone who listens to this, who's going through the, you know, the Jedi archives a thousand years from now and can see the, the actual talk that I keep referencing. Um, but, um, obviously, you, you know, the, something that you said just now that I've actually never known about you was when you said, uh, you had given up, uh, when you got into games, you had given up on music. And I know you played in a band at one point because I, I keep seeing these Peacemaker uh, 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 posts from you, which is so funny. And I want you to say what that's all about. Mm. But but also, I remember when Elena and I did this talk, she had a kind of similar arc. You know, she kind of tried the freelance composer thing and really it wasn't working for her. And so then yeah. she kind of went a different path. And I, I had no idea there was a parallelism between you two to some degree. Yeah. Um, so... What was that initial thing that you were then giving up on? Like, how? Did, what shape did that take? Because this is something I realize I don't. I don't actually know about you. Yeah. Um, well, with Lena, it's funny. It's ironic that ArenaNet became this opportunity that allowed us to hit the reset button and do what we wanted to. So I'm grateful for that, um, and of course, so happy for her continued success because she, she deserves to be doing that. She should. That's what she should be doing. But so cool that you had her contribute. You know, more music to this too. It felt like the band reunion in a way and some, even though, you, you know, it's not quite that, but there's something, it's like the family, it's like family reunion maybe. Yeah, better, yeah, better yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, uh, you know, I spent, I went to Berkeley, but I didn't study film scoring there. I, I fully intended to come out of that school and hit the ground as a performer and try to be a rock star. And, and um, we're roughly the same age. I think I'm a little older, but when I was getting out of school, you know, I've been out of school now for, uh, it'll be 20 years next year, which is sad mm -hmm. to think about. Um, <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I, it's, I'm, I'm very grateful for my life and the journey I've been on since then. But, you know, at the time that era, 2003 was when I graduated was right when Napster was happening. You know, people, there was so much panic in the industry that this was going to ruin everything. And it kind of did like all the executives that would come and give guest lectures were, it, it was, it would be very combative because we were the young kids being like, no, this is the future. And why are you, what are you so scared of? And of course, all their fears sort of came to pass where it completely bottomed out the entire industry, but it, it, it was only at the start of that. So I thought, 
you know, I was aware of games as, as, a, as a career path back then because this was just PlayStation 2 era and things sophist- more sophisticated things were happening. Were you a gamer? Sort of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but only really in college. Uh, as a kid, I only had a Game Boy, and that was it. My parents mm. refused. They're like, we don't want anything that's going to glue you to the television any more than you already are. At least with a Game Boy, you can take it outside, you know? That's funny. Um, but then when I kind of had my own money and, and, you know, I would spend the money I was supposed to spend on books on a PlayStation, you know? <laughs> um so I, I, what, what was happening when I got out of school was I realized I was reading so many articles, and this was 20 years ago, articles that, that we still see the, this headline today of games have outsold CD sales and movie ticket sales combined for the year, right? Right. And, and I thought, well, that's an interesting trend, um, and that probably seems like that's going to continue if, I'm, if my you know, gut is telling me anything. But I love playing in bands. I've dreamt of this. I have to try to be a rock star. I just got to try it and see what happens. And it's a young man's game, certainly, or a young person's game. For sure. Um, and I spent most of my 20s, yeah, in a van, just driving around the country and playing shows and some amazing ones. And Were some... you touring with different outfits or was it once recurrent? Like, did you have your band? or A couple, yeah. So the, I started off as a roadie for a band. That was my first road experience. And that was fun. Um, a little bit less pressure, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of the performance, but all of the grind, right? But yeah. but the, but I, I hadn't been disillusioned yet. It was all romantic to me, um, and and to get to see the country, it's I've been I've been pretty much everywhere at least once, if not multiple times. So I have frames Amazing. of reference for a lot of people that I meet. You know, oh, I've been there, I've eaten there, I've played a show there, or whatever. And I think it's a really cool way to to That's get to know your, your country, right? The U.S. is a big place, so it's it's, it's a great way to do it. Um, and then I joined that band for a while, uh, and then the band that really sort of got us closest to anything approximating success is probably the band, it's the Peacemaker band, right? Uh, it's a band called Bang Camaro, um, and Bang Camaro was a novel concept, it was, it was a novelty. We weren't a joke band, but it was definitely, uh, it, was, it was a sort of tongue-in-cheek kind of thing mm-hmm. where... I, you know, I go Google it and you can, you'll see immediately what, what it was, but it was basically this idea of kind of like, um, oh gosh, what are they called? The, uh, what was that group out of Austin that had 10 billion, the something polyphonic spree. It was like the polyphonic spree. They had Actually, sort of a moment, know. they were that sort of a hipster, you know, moment, uh, in the early two thousands, but basically it was this idea of you just hmm. have a huge group on stage. Um, and, but we did it in this, in the service of this kind of music we liked, which was sort of hard rock, heavy metal, late seventies, early mid eighties kind of stuff. And, you know, our, our elevator pitch we would give to people was, um, you go to a karaoke night, inevitably someone picks Def Leppard's pour some sugar on me. (laughs) Right. And everybody in the room knows the chorus to that song and nobody knows the verse and including the person that chose the song, they'll get up there and sing the, start singing it. And they get to the verse and they're like, and they sort of they're all wrong and they sort of you hear one out of every five words but then the chorus comes and everybody's like pour some sugar you know so you've got fists in the air and everybody's excited so we're like well what if we had a band that just got rid of all the stuff that no one cares about in those songs like the verses and just had awesome choruses endless power anthems yeah and guitar solos it's the only reason you listen to that stuff so it's just guitar solos and sing-along choruses and that's what that's what the band was that's so and, funny and it was fun i mean it was it was it was cool we, we did we I got to check off a lot of stuff in my childhood kind of bucket list, you know, playing shows and meeting pe- interesting people. The, the only thing was we never made any money. Um, but w- I rode the wave for as long as I could. Well, how, 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 how kind of high did that group peak in terms of? They got on Conan O'Brien after I quit. Uh, but I think it was the momentum of what we had done got the band there. Um, and that was sort of the, that was definitely the apex and it was, it was downhill from there, from there. <laughs> well, no, actually I would argue the apex is what just happened. Uh, yeah. Well, the band continues to surprise me, uh, after all these, I mean, this was like 15 years ago now. Um, but apparently James Gunn, director James Gunn is a big fan of that kind of music and specifically licensed. I thought it was just for the trailer for Peacemaker, but it's in, it's fully in one of the episodes as the, the climax of that episode for a solid you know, minute, which in terms of licensed music in a TV show is, is a very long chunk. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and, it, and it works. It, it works in that moment. It's, it's kind of fun to resurrect the band a bit. Uh, but the, my, how it relates to games is that was really the last one I tried in to, be, to say, we're going to do this. We're going to be a success. But we were based out of Boston, and a significant number of people in that band were in the Boston game industry. Um, and one of the founders of the band, one of the other guitar, I was playing guitar and keyboards. Uh, and so one of the other guitar players was a programmer at Harmonix, 
um, <laughs> music systems, makers of Guitar Hero 1 and 2 and yep. the Rock Band series. And I, I'd known him even before he started working there, and, and I had picked his brain. He was the first person I asked, like, can I come in and check out your studio, you know, his game studio, and, and maybe meet the audio director, and maybe this will be a way in. He had worked at, like, Irrational and Iron Lore, which doesn't exist anymore. but um, Nor he, Irrational. Nor irrational, but but it, there's there's a, a small pool of people that have been making games since the Looking Glass. Looking Glass was sort of the you yep. know the seed. It's that, the Ken. It's the like Ken Levine yeah. solar system. Yeah, yeah. And so he was part of that. But he was working at Harmonix, and and like many uh, like half of Harmonix was all strictly game people, and the other half was like cool rock and roll people from Boston because they wanted to make that. Speaking of making things authentic, they wanted to make sure that the people making this game knew what it was like to do the thing they were trying to replicate. Right. Um, I never knew that about them. Yeah it's, yeah, it's actually surprising that that would even be possible given the sophisticated audio programming needs at a place like Harmonix. I would argue that it's less sophisticated than you think. Uh, I, I'm I'm very throwing grave. them under the bus. No, I I think they would admit it too. Uh, maybe I don't know, but if you talk to people that that pass through there, you know, it's they do one thing really really well, right? Um, but uh, they. Uh, so one of the things that happened, right, the, 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 how I made this transition was I quit the band and my bandmate, Bryn, Bryn Bennett, great guy, um, he, he knew that I was interested in games. He didn't have to do this. But at the time, I quit right when Rock Band 1 had come out. And part of the success of the band is owed to the fact that we were in Guitar Hero 2 and Rock Band. And some of the most, they're just the songs we did were so perfect for that type of game because it's all just soloing and, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, we were able to tour in a lot of spots based on the success of those of the rock band series. <laughs> I love that. That's yeah, so yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I remember very distinctly playing a festival in Milwaukee and having there's a little kid in the right in the front, right up against the stage, air guitaring. And it was halfway through the show that I realized he wasn't like playing air guitar. He was playing the literally charts South to the Park song episode. Yeah, you, like, yeah. You've yeah. seen that, right? The guitar yes. hero. Like it, it is that these kids who are listening to like Wayward Son. Yeah, and like the, the like the, the just the the disconnect from the actual sort of history of the music, or or, or was it Fortunate Son? I mean, uh, what's the well, whatever it is, I'm blanking on on, um, on what it what it is. That's like they build that whole episode around. Um, but like he's in the restaurant. Show me your solo, kid, and everyone's snapping along. Is I didn't realize that it was as close to a real thing. Yeah, it, I, not even close. That is that is real life. That was my life for <laughs> several years. That is um, so funny. So yeah, I, I left the band. It was just I had reached the end of my tolerance level for it. And but he, the studio was expanding. Harmonix was expanding so aggressively because Rock Band it just was lightning in a bottle. Um, and he knew that I was interested in games. And he kind of put the frustration of a, I would you know say a, a key member of the band leaving. Um, at yeah. a time where it was, you know, not a great time to leave if they thought there was prospects of success on the horizon. Um, but he was like, yeah, well, if you, you know, if you still want to get into games, give me your resume and I'll pass it along and, and we'll see what we can do. And that was how, that was how it started. So I, I, you know, my, I kicked off my career just charting stuff for rock band. Uh, but the thing I want to kind of tug at more is you framed it as you had given up on music. Yeah, well, that was the moment where I, I I decided if this is it. I can make a career out of doing sound design, and I love I, I love this. I love working in games. We weren't doing we weren't actually doing sound design despite being called sound designers. It was just a formality of being the in the audio department. Mm. But I thought you know this is great. Like it's a steady gig that I'm happy to show up for. Whereas before I worked at Trader Joe's and in offices and just anything that I could quit at a moment's notice or take a week off and not get fired from. You know, right? Yeah, sure, for a gig or somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's just I, the, the reason I was asking you is that you framed it like you were kind of at this wit's end, you know, this moment of I just can't do this anymore. But it, it doesn't sound like a horrible story. Maybe you're sparing me the grisly details. Well, but it sounds like you kind of felt like you took this very calm, level headed assessment of I think this is probably played out and I should find something else. Yeah. Well, I, I, I knew or at least I, I, I assessed that. I wasn't going to do better than this band. And if that band couldn't do it, then it just wasn't going to happen. And I was, mm. I was getting close to 30 at that point. And Boston, for as many things, uh, which we can record another pot, or probably not record the, that conversation, but uh, it's filled with a lot of really bitter aging musicians that think that they had a moment where it could have been their big break and weren't either willing to make the leap to a place like New York or Los Angeles 
or for whatever reason, it just didn't happen for them. And this, the, there's so many of those people and I was surrounded by them and I just was like, I can't be that guy. I can't be the guy in my thirties playing in a club for a hundred people saying, man, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, we were playing to, you know, 2000 people or, or we opened for X band on, you know, whatever stadium tour. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't let music get ruined by, I, I couldn't have that taken out of my totally control. Get that. Um, and that was kind of the moment I had to make a decision. I'm like, I got to do something that utilizes the same skill set that that charges me in the same way that music does, even if it's not music. And the games thing and, and, and game audio specifically was like, there was enough of a crossover on that Venn diagram that I thought I could be happy doing this. Uh, well, so then obviously at some point the itch um, had to get scratched uh of of feeling now restless in mm. the sound design world and i, I know it kind of started with you know this current stuff and now we're sort of making our way back to the it's like the movie that's oh has the cold open on mm -hmm. the you know dramatic cliffhanger <laughs> present day moment and then it's 12 hours earlier um so forgive the cliche structure to this but what was so what was the how did that transition work because I think Lena is the only other person that I've talked to on on this. Actually, actually no, Buzz Burrows. Uh, mm. Speaking of harmonics, he's there now. Yeah. Um, his arc was also similar of kind of like this giant, uh, you know, horseshoe of started in one place, career kind of took me to another place, and then eventually it was like I kind of want to get back to the thing that I was doing. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, and obviously Lena's is similar. So what? What was that pivot point for you? What pushed you to say, I wonder if I can ingratiate myself to the musical side of what was going on here at ArenaNet? Yeah. Well, at the, so in the run up to shipping Guild Wars 2, um, part of my job was to do the music implementation, right? I was getting all these tracks from Jeremy and figuring out where they should go. Uh, the and engine is not very sophisticated, so it's not like we're doing interesting dynamic stuff, but somebody has to still put stuff in and and make it feel like it you know belongs there so we got to the kind of end of that production cycle we were ready to ship guild wars 2 and they decided they were wanted to bring somebody in-house they wanted to go in a different direction with the music and the audio director at the time was no longer there uh he came to me and said well hey you're the music guy uh can you find some people that we can reach out to 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 you know take over basically um and i thought yeah sure you know this some homework, a homework, a homework assignment that I can tackle. And I started putting together a short list, which your name was on, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. That's so um, funny. Just thinking like, who's you music bastard? Do? Yeah. You <laughs> took my job. I, I think you did fine. You did fine. Um, but I'm actually yeah. really surprised. When, what year was this? I'm actually really surprised to hear that. I've never, you've never told me that. Uh, I think it would have been summer of 2012. Um, That's funny. Yeah. So I, I guess Journey had been out. I think it was very fresh. I mean, we just hit the 10-year mark, right? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. March it, it was out, and I'd, like, fallen in love with it, you know, and so did, so did everybody else. So I thought, okay, well, that's a good name to start with. And then <laughs> well, I, that's I, nice. I, I got maybe two or three names in, and the light bulb went off, right, where I, I said, wait a second. This I'm is, better than all these people. No, no, absolutely not. But, but I, I, it was, uh, you know, I thought, this is opportunity knocking as loud as it's probably ever going to knock in my entire life, and here's a chance to come back and do the thing that I truly want to do like if somebody had a gun to my head and said you got to pick one sound design for games or music for games for the rest of your life it's a common scenario Co very common it's, hostage, it happened to me hostage. just before yeah it happened yeah. to me yesterday actually <laughs> um but you know it was a no-brainer and i thought i have to at least ask and if i if they say no then i'll continue to do my job and i'll be happy but if i say if i go to them with enough of a case to say let me try you know um, and at that point, like I said, I went to Berkeley, but I don't have a film scoring degree. I didn't study it there. I took a one-on-one level class that was like, these are called spotting notes and this is time mm -hmm. code, you know, like that level of stuff. Uh, so I, I went to my boss at the time, the audio director and said, Hey, I don't have a demo reel. I don't even have a piece of paper that says you have achieved this mark in film scoring. But, um, here, here are the advantages of hiring me to do this is I, I know the game better than any freelance person that we could get in. No kidding. I know this team, right? And I know the tools that we use, which are all proprietary. I know all the other teams. I know everybody else at the studio and have a good relationship with them. And, you know, and I know how to write music. And I said, the, mu the music's up here. I just need some time to figure out the technical side of how to get it out. So it was literally like a Rudy level, like put me in coach kind of thing, you know? <laughs> Um, and, and 
we still hadn't quite finished Guild Wars 2. We were really close. And so my boss very graciously said, okay, well, let me talk to the head of the studio and see what he thinks. And he said, yeah, let's, let's try it. But, but you have to finish what, you're, what we hired you to do, and we got to get this game out the door. So there was about a three-month period where I was, um, I was doing two jobs. Nine to five, I was doing sound design and implementation. And then every single night, I was staying there till midnight. Every weekend, I was coming in. I was buying scores. I was going to the library. I was, they bought me some software and a computer to kind of get me started. But then it was up to me to figure out how to produce something at the same level compositionally and technically, you know, from a production standpoint with virtual instruments that that could be slotted into the game and stand next to yeah, anything not else that noticeably was in there. different. Yeah. And and so, you know, it, that took a few months of a lot of work. And then I put something in front of the audio director and uh, and, you know, th that was 10 years ago. And I kind of haven't looked back since. You know, what's funny. You just made me realize something. Um, you just contextualized a moment. I remember around that time was the first time I was made aware of who you are because our mutual friend Kate, mm -hmm. who was at ArenaNet, sent me a piece of music yeah. and was like, my friend McLean is, you know, starting to cook up some music. I'm curious your thoughts on this. And it, it dawns on me, I thought it was, I, I bet she was like, this was like advocacy for you to, to sort of like see how this what do other people think? How how mm. is this? You know, what's the like reconning? You know, am yeah. I how close am I getting to this goal? Didn't I would have told her not to do. If she told me she was going to do that, I would have been like, <laughs> well, "Hell no! Please don't do that." <laughs> she really was still this day, as far as I'm aware, is you know, big believer in you, big yeah. big big uh, fan of you, you know, and like really wanted you to succeed. Um, and uh, and and not that I held the keys to any kingdom. I think it was more just like I was probably the only other composer she knew and was you yeah. know, saying what what. What do you what do you think? Is this is this is this hold up or whatever? And yeah, and, and uh, I, I I wish I could remember what she sent or what the context. I don't don't go back through your email looking for it, please. <laughs> <laughs> it just it dawns on me that this it, this was in that time frame and it, and this was probably the like one of those yeah I'm getting my I'm getting my shit together yeah uh, yeah works and I've never really thought about what the context would have been. It just seemed like oh here's a PC row. What do you what do you think? And I remember at the time I was a little bit like. I thought that was all Jeremy soul music and I remember, but I didn't, for some reason I was like distracted or she caught me in a weird moment or something that I didn't like investigate fully because there were definitely question marks about it. And you just suddenly, all it's like that moment in Ratatouille where I just had this, yeah. and then I suddenly <laughs> understand what was going on in that moment. Um, there's something that I have to highlight because obviously one of the goals, at least for me with this podcast, is as a, just a continuing resource for composers who are you know just getting in or even just creative people in general, you know, sound designers or artists or anybody but people that would be more or less on a similar path of just the inevitable what am i what am i supposed to do how, how do i go from here if i see someone doing a thing i think is cool how do i what steps get me into that you know the room where it happens mm. and something that seems to be a common ingredient with every story you've told that i also have to say i, I didn't quite know or fully appreciate about you is you have a real kind of radical openness. Most people go through life with a certain amount of tunnel vision because especially the older you get, the more, you know, how many grandparents do we have or aunts and uncles or whatever that you ask them something, they're like, ah, I'm too old to change my ways. You know, mm. like that's a kind of motif. That's like a trope, right? And because this idea that as we get older, we just, we, we know the things we like, we, our diet becomes less varied, all that kind of stuff. Um, and our openness to new music. And as you're talking about, oh, you know, here I am in my 40s and I'm, I'm, I'm as excited as I've ever been about this. I've discovered that thing. But even just the moment of going, why am I about to go try to help them hire somebody when this could be that moment? And I'm just curious, what, what do you attribute that to? It's a rare quality. A lot of people, mm. those, those bitter Bostonians, <laughs> that's a normal... As much as they probably aggregate in that city more than average, that's a that's a typical thing where people go, ah, you know, I should have had that shot, or I should, you know, I got screwed, or they build all this bitterness, and you realize this, it, you probably had it, you probably didn't know it was in front of you, right? And that's just a tragic truth, or maybe you were you were pushing it away and afraid of it, afraid of success, all that kind of psychological analysis of it. But 
you, you seem to be really wired the opposite. You really, you, you seem to have a really good sense of when there's something in front of you. I mean, even just that moment of deciding not to continue forward with the band, this is a recurring motif in every story that you've told is this, you seem to have a kind of a bird's eye view more than most of your own life. I mean, mm. Do you have anything you could, are your parents like that? I mean, what, where do you, that's just so uncommon. It's, I'm finding it very exciting to hear that. Uh, yeah, I, I think my, my folks are a little bit like that. I, uh, maybe some, like my dad certainly is to a more extreme degree. We're not, we're not very similar. I mean, I love him obviously, but like, uh, or maybe not obviously, obviously, but I do love him. <laughs> um, but he's very different from me, uh, in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm a lot closer to my mom, but my dad is the kind of guy who he, he's kind of says the same, he's a dad. So he says the same, like 10 things over and over and over again. <laughs> and one of the things he always says is, is like, he's always talking about make a plan and execute it, you know? Um, and not, not from the, he's a, he's a sort of happy go lucky kind of guy, uh, in the, in the mold of the dude. Um, but, mm -hmm. but he is very much about like looking forward and planning and anticipating scenarios. And, uh, I don't know, I'm, 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 I live in my head, right. I'm sort of one of these people that is totally happy to be sitting in a room alone, just like daydreaming. I told my wife this once it blew her mind. I said, I'm incapable of wasting my own time. Other people can waste my time, but I, I can't because I could just sit there and be like, la di da and just like something will be keep, keeping me interested in my own head, right? And I'm, I'm nothing if not self-reflective. Right. Uh, so I'm always kind of looking for opportunities to bet on myself and, and have some confidence that, that that'll work out and, and recognizing when a scenario has sort of gotten to its, you know, its logical end point. I'm just, but it's still, I, I, I'm curious where one learns that because it's, I mean, maybe it's innate. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that I could say that's truly an innate characteristic of, mm. of, 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 uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I have, I don't know. It's, it's, I just, it's, it's interesting to hear. And it, it, it it's such an interesting common thread, uh, with everything that you've been talking about that I just can't help but turn into a kind of brain archaeologists going uh um where does that come from because yeah. it's very inspiring and i think it's one of those that it's especially for anybody who listens to this down the road that that's kind of at that early stage and the deer and headlights looking at the intimidating big wide world of this industry that we both have experienced our versions of and everybody does it's such a powerful philosophy to to, to have because you know you walk in and, and like, you know, I, well, I could go on a million tangents about it, but I, I, I was curious if you had any kind of it, the way you tell stories, it almost felt like you were going to go, actually, June 7th, 1999, <laughs> this is the thing that happened that changed my life. Because actually, that, I do have a version of that for mm. myself. And so I, I, I was sort of hunting for a thing I didn't know what I was hunting. Yeah, for. I, I, I do think it's just it's just kind of the way my brain's wired. You know, uh, there's no there's no magic to it. Uh, it's I've, it's how I've always thought about the world in my life. And, and it's, it's worked out so far. <laughs> oh, well, I love it. Uh, it's a shame that uh, um, Crucible didn't quite uh, go as anybody had hoped, I suspect. Um, yeah. But um, I appreciated you giving a little, uh, you know, hey, I've, I've also done some other stuff yeah. uh, at that. <laughs> and, uh, and more stuff is coming. You know, I think this would be an exciting year. That's really good to hear. Well, I really, really hope that, uh, you know, I hope that a lot of people take notice of what you've done on this latest, um, I keep blanking on the name of it, um, the, the new Guild Wars. End of Dragons. End of Dragons. I, my brain just keeps going to like the Blood Dragon, you know, the Ubisoft. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, End of Dragons. Um, I, I really hope that if anyone listens to this right now and hasn't checked it out, uh, they, they simply must. Um, but hopefully by the time this is published, plenty more people will have because it just to me, it represents a, a level of commitment to the artistry of, of what is music and to the evolving nature of the way music music's role in this idea of being kind of global citizens there's just so much i could say endlessly praising i'm so glad that schedule of this worked out to be able to go to your talk and then immediately start this yeah. where it's super fresh <laughs> and i'm just so high off of it uh i also get very high during your talk uh <laughs> no for real man it really it's just so good so well thank um, you yeah thank, man thanks for being there and thank you for this this is this is great I, I got, yeah, I was excited. I, I, of course, admired your talent and your career trajectory and everything uh, and, and was all too happy to, to do this with you and to just let your, your pearls of wisdom and your wit out uh, through this channel. But um, 
but I was actually underprepared for how inspiring that was going to be. So mm, great. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you.